thank you for uh, watching this uh, video. Um, I have been asked to uh, review some of um, the issues you may encounter uh, in somebody who is struggling with an eating disorder and uh, may or may not identify as uh, having a, um, a different sexual orientation, gender identity. Uh, we refer to the population as a whole as a sexually diverse population. To that end, um, uh, it would be very helpful if we probably um, uh, speak the same language. And um, I'm referring to uh, what does uh, constitute an eating disorder. And so um, there is two major uh, ways of looking at eating disorders from the healthcare provider point of view. And that relates to uh, um, um, looking at uh, the classification of these uh, conditions uh, such as anorexia nervosa or bulimia nervosa, among others. Uh, and uh, part of uh, the major issue that the person struggling with this uh, problem deals with is that of uh, what we refer to as body image distortion. And if I may use some of the conceptualization we have used over the years, the uh, core psychopathology refers to that uh, fear of fatness, pursuit of thinness, uh, distorted body image, as I mentioned before, and certainly that uh, um, uh, concern with weight shape uh, that is certainly not driven by the individuals volitionally, but by uh, some factors that we still don't understand. As I mentioned before, we're going to be looking at a sexually diverse population, and to this end, there is four main constructs that I would like to review with you. One of which is a sexual orientation, which relates to the attraction to others. Um, gender identity is that, um, that congruency between our, uh, if I can put it this way, our genitals, how we're born with, and how we feel about, um, about such. Uh, um, gender expression, meaning the way we present ourselves uh, to the world, how we dress, what we like to do, how we like to um, 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 do our hair, nails, so forth. And lastly, again, your uh, sex, sex at birth. Uh, that's uh, in our society something known as the binary, male, female. Now, uh, I would like to um, um, uh, review with you uh, what is uh, known about eating disorders in general as conditions that affect uh, quite a large proportion of the population, somewhere between 1% and 3%, which is a significant number of uh, people uh, struggle with an eating disorder. So one of the things I've learned through my career that has been helpful to me is what it would be a possible risk factor for somebody to develop an eating disorder, and that's the one of uh, dieting. So uh, interestingly enough, and in the past at least uh, six, seven decades, if not longer, there has been a significant shift in our society towards that ideal in terms of uh, particularly the female body habitus, which um, uh, includes uh, the one of uh, dieting. Um, as I mentioned before, there are different types of uh, struggles that people go through. and. It's an interesting misconception in society. Anorexia nervosa was described in the 1700s and uh, Sir William Gold did this in England. And again, so it's a condition that we know for over two, close to 300 years, as opposed to bulimia nervosa. And I wanna clarify something that it's, it's misconstrued in society and it's this issue of when people talk about bulimia nervosa, they refer to as somebody vomiting and that is actually not, the issue, this condition was described only in the late uh, 70s, early 80s by Dr. Russell in England. And he uh, called this uh, bulimia nervosa a variant of anorexia nervosa, uh, an ominous variant actually, he called it. And he was referring to a Greek word that means ox hunger, which is the process of binging, which is eating a large amount of food in a short period of time. So again, I think those are important issues and lastly, I wanted to make a point that might be uh, helpful to you, which is a good friend of mine, a psychologist in British Columbia, taught me something. Uh, and he said to me, Jorge, when I see a young person walk into my office and said, I am bulimic or I am anorexic, 
uh, I think that's a tragedy. And what he was meaning and he was trying to help me with was to not identify individuals with the condition they are struggling with, to not pathologize people, more so to try to understand and help them. I wanted to just share a little bit of my experience with you in terms of the natural history and the outcomes uh, related to what it's like to live or struggle with an eating disorder and what tends to happen. And so I am very fortunate to work with young people, meaning children, adolescents, and young adults, and their families, particularly their families. And what I have learned through the years is that um, the, the outcomes, meaning when there is an intervention, a way to help these young people and their families are quite positive. They are good and they are uh, quoted as high as 75 to 85 percent of people will recover uh, with treatment that may last one, two years on average, maybe more, maybe less. And uh, the core aspect of the treatment other than the young person suffering from it is the family. And we look at the family as the support system that is going to help the young person recover. So that's important because when you compare that to the adults and to the natural history of the condition, obviously we wouldn't know what tends to happen, but from the literature we have learned that uh, up to half of the people who struggle with this problem for 10, 15 years uh, will continue to struggle with this for years. So that's why I thought this is important because the same way I tell a family or a young person that the diagnosis is serious and is difficult, it is also important to let them know that the outcomes are very positive for the young people. One thing that I think is important as we are trying to understand how do eating disorders present in a sexually diverse population is uh, I previously mentioned before a couple of the constructs uh, such as uh, the, gender exp the, the, yeah, the gender expression, uh, as well as the body image distortion. So there is a, what I consider a difference that is uh, important to make and a difference that we can appreciate as a clinician and relates to the fact that body image distortion is the core aspect of struggling with an eating disorder. Is that looking at the mirror, looking at yourself, and seeing yourself as somebody who is overweight, fat, hating that, not being able to accept that, and seeing yourself as somebody who is overweight, obese, or fat. And that's very painful to the individual. In the context of sexually diverse population, particularly gender dysphoria, this is quite different. So I did speak about body image distortion and I wanted to make a point about a term that I've been uh, hearing and is uh, referred to as uh, people use the term body dysmorphia and um, they are trying to again relate these to the body image distortion the individual with an eating disorder is suffering. So body dysmorphia again is a concept that uh, is quite different uh, in, in it relates uh, to this discomfort, these uh, problems an individual is having with certain aspects of their body and they need to do something about it and change it. So it's not part of the core psychopathology of the eating disorder struggle. It is something completely different. And I thought I would make a point about it. Not that it's wrong to use it, but in the context of what we think and how we conceptualize this to help people, they are two different constructs. Gender dysphoria is that incongruency between our identity and what we have in terms of our body and uh, mostly related to genitals or our upper body, meaning the chest, the breast for some individuals. Uh, but it could be your hands, it could be your feet, it could be your Adam's apple, it could be your voice. But you could see how different gender dysphoria is from body image distortion. This relates to the development of the secondary sexual characteristics. And if I can give you an example of an individual whose gender was uh, assigned at birth as a female, and they are uh, transitioning uh, towards being a male, um, this person will have significant distress, particularly with their chest. And that uh, is one of the number one sources of dysphoria for these individuals as opposed to somebody who is, uh, whose gender assigned at birth was one of a male, uh, their lower 
uh, part of their body, their genitalia, is a significant source of distress that it represents itself or it presents itself uh, as uh, significant unhappiness, uh, miserable, uh, scary, um, um, day to day, minute to minute uh, way of looking at yourself and not feeling that you are who you believe you are. So you could see the difference between what I was trying to point out as body image distortion and what I could summarize as the development of secondary sexual characteristics that um, uh, present differently in the populations. As we talk about this in the, in the field of uh, uh, gender and sexually diverse uh, populations, we talk about gender affirming, for example, or affirming approaches. And one of the things I have found uh, most important and helpful is to listen respectfully to my patients. And I'm talking as a healthcare provider. Uh, some of us refer to as clients, consumers, uh, at the end, people, and people that we're trying to help, support. And now I would like to shift gears and look at how do we support and help our loved ones, either family or friends, struggling with these uh, issues. Uh, there is a number of resources that I have come across and that I couldn't enumerate all of them, but there is one called the WPATH, so W-P-A-T-H, which is World Professional Association of Transgender Health. This um, uh, resource, it's based in North America, has been around for around 50 years, and initially was called the Harry Benjamin Society, and for the past couple of decades is the WPATH, and they have developed something referred to as the standards of care. And the reason I bring this up is because there is so much information that is easily accessible that may not be as reliable as we hope it is. So if you are looking for reliable information, the WPATH standards of care at this point, version seven, the version eight will be coming at some point. It's a very good place to look at as friends, family, or as an individual who is wondering about these issues. Um, there is a couple of local resources like Calgary Outlink, uh, Calgary uh, Sexual Health, uh, the Skipping Stones Foundation, and uh, the sexual and reproductive uh, health clinics that are set up for young people in our city uh, and are run by primary care providers and offer a great support. Um, in terms of uh, people who, who are struggling with an eating disorder, I previously mentioned that I believe active listening, and I know it's, it's a skill that is not easily acquired. And by that I mean, I'll give you an example of what I tend to do when I am actively listening to a, a person, uh, and is that of reflecting back what you heard from them. Uh, and certainly if you feel that uh, you are distressed or you are concerned or you want to be supportive, Using the I statements tend to be very helpful and it's reflecting how you feel, how you are adapting to the situation the young person or the person is presenting to you. So again, I find that the active listening is um, it's, uh, very important. Uh, also important and something I have learned is to be aware of what I and we refer to as uh, boundaries. So your own boundaries. In, in trying to help somebody because uh, like if you have had the, the benefit or the pleasure of just catching an airplane, you see it very commonly. They say, well, put the mask first on your face before you try to help anybody because you're not gonna be helpful to anyone if you pass out. So the same idea with the boundaries relates to this issue of uh, you need to make sure that you are feeling capable and able to absorb the pain that this person is presenting to you and discussing with you. And um, since we're talking about youth and young people, I think it's important to keep in mind, I always feel very hopeful uh, in the sense that young people are growing, developing their evolving brain, as you have heard probably in the media, you might have read yourself. They continue to change in terms of biologically, the substrate of the brain up to their mid-twenties, and that's what we, I think, used to call many years ago, oh, the person is maturing, or so forth. I would like to talk to you a little bit about why is this important, what I just reflected back and I mentioned to you in terms of the support, the help, and so forth. And 
there are three particular strong emotions that I have come across in my career that tend to drive the distress, the pain, the discomfort, and the horrific lives some of the people who suffer from this condition. And I'm speaking specifically about the eating disorder uh, and suffer from the gender dysphoria, which is not considered a condition per se, again, uh, more so a state in life. So those are guilt, shame, and blame. And they are three common denominators to human suffering. But again, another good friend, a mentor of mine in Vancouver, uh, one day we were jogging and he said to me, Jorge, um, uh, guilt is such a powerful emotion. And he, he kind of grabbed my arm and kind of twisted it like this. And he said, guilt is something that you cannot brush, you cannot remove, you cannot cut, you cannot clean. Something that comes from within. And uh, the reason I bring that, this up to you, friends, family, and individuals who are suffering from uh, this particular, uh, sometimes strong negative emotion, is that uh, guilt comes from within. And occasionally you hear, well, don't feel guilty, or don't feel bad, or oh, I'll be okay. Or, and sometimes uh, that may be helpful, but most of the time it doesn't come across as, as uh, helpful to the individual. And I also mentioned shame and blame, and you could see how these powerful emotions can be so destructive, particularly the shame that either families, parents, young people can suffer from. So if I can summarize what I have talked to you about it uh, in a few words. Uh, uh, firstly, uh, again, thank you for watching this, and I hope this is helpful to you and your loved ones. Um, uh, we're talking about that interface between uh, having an eating disorder and how they may present in a sexually diverse population and um, uh, how can we support somebody who is struggling to this very um, difficult time. So one of my best um, um, pieces of advice, if I can call it that, or one of my best suggestion is remember to respo respectfully listen to that person. Uh, remember that is, uh, you are there, probably as a sounding board, maybe as somebody who can provide some uh, support, uh, some guidance. And at the end, you are trying to provide um, uh, the best, to, to the best of your abilities, or myself to that matter, um, uh, a place for somebody who is suffering tremendously. So I mentioned a few resources. I mentioned um, um, uh, some of the very powerful negative emotions. And uh, again, I, I, I hope that uh, you can help those uh, suffering from uh, an eating disorder and might be uh, also struggling with uh, their sexuality or their gender identity.